Well, welcome back to our Wednesday midweek Bible study. We're in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse um, 16 today. Hope you're having fun. This should be fun. It should be meaningful and deep and all that, but it should be fun as well. So hang in there. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's going to poke the Pharisees. Now, Pharisees would have been in a crowd, and they would have been gathered over here huddling, having discussions about this guy while Jesus is speaking. So when he starts pointing them out, there would be some people a little bit nervous, some people laughing uh, because they weren't fans of the Pharisees. Uh, Other people would be rather neutral saying, all right, what's going to happen here? But he looks over and he goes, when you fast, don't look sober as the uh, somber as the hypocrites do. And again, he'd been talking about Pharisees and teachers of the law before. For they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. You know, perhaps a little frown, downcast, maybe a little bit of dirt on their face. Uh, He says, truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. You've seen this now three different times. If we do it to be seen of men and to get their approval uh, or their respect, then we've gotten everything we were going for. So we're not getting anything from God. And that's kind of scary. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. What's oil on your head? If you live in hot places with a lot of sun, oil in your hair and on your head is protective. It soothes your skin. It soothes the scalp. Uh, it is, it's pretty important. And so it's another way of saying fix your hair, fix your face, wash so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I've been in churches before where a group has decided we're going to fast for a day or two days, or we're going to do this kind of fast or that kind of fast. I've done Monday morning messages on fasting, and you can find those at uh, our YouTube page if you have any trouble you can send us a note at info at rsafeharbor.com. We'll help you find them. So I'm not going to go into fasting now. I want, to get, I want to hit a misconception. Some people didn't want to join the group for fasting, and it was for a particular purpose, because they planned to fast. But they didn't want to join the group because they, they believed that this was teaching, no, you can't let anybody know you're fasting. That's not what he's saying. Look again. Don't, don't make it obvious to others that you're fasting. So you don't put yourself in a pained way and act like you're really being put out and look what I'm doing for God. No, but it's all right to let people know when I say I'm praying for you. Does that mean I've violated that go into your closet and prayer, pray thing that we just got covered last week? No, no. But if I'm praying in such a way as to draw attention to myself, then that's a problem. The same with fasting, same with giving. We do it for God. If others see and understand it and know it, great. But as the scripture gave us in the Sermon on the Mount already, let them then praise God, not us, for what is happening. A great example is our Safe Harbor Church. We started right here, a tripod there with an iPhone on it on a very stormy night when YouTube went down over half of the United States. This is obviously not growing because of us. It isn't because of our tech. It's not because of the speaker. It's not because of my vision. I didn't really have one. Uh, It's not because of our board who do a a bang up job, mind you, making sure the money is done well, that we're giving to charities, that we're not parking money for our own, um, you know, our own, what what do I call it? So that we're, we're not super rich and you know, we ignore the, the charities. You know, they want to make sure that things are done well. But it's not because of them. It's not because of me. We didn't have the idea that this was going to grow as it has. This is a thing of God. And the cool thing is, almost everybody gets that. I rarely get something that goes, you know, oh, Patrick, you had this great vision. And I'm glad because I always have to respond back, no, I didn't. I sincerely had no idea this would last six months or outlast COVID. It, this is entirely 100% the work of Almighty God. And most people see that. 
and I praise God for it. Even the prisoners that we go see in Louisiana State Penitentiary give all the praise to God. I have not heard them once praise me or the soundstage team or any of that. They know we didn't do this. This has to be of God. Well, the same with your fasting, the same with your giving to us, to other charities, uh, the same with your prayers. Do it in such a way that people just know, all right, that came from God. That had to be a God thing. Well, let's go on. Let's talk about money. Jesus talked about money a lot. And he would disapprove of a lot of the commercials we see about storing up stuff. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wow. Does that mean you can't have a retirement account? No. No. Again, don't overplay this hand. Understand what he is saying. I can remember we had a youth group that wanted to do a Sunday evening activity. Uh, a person's house was mentioned and the woman of the house said no because she just had new carpets and didn't want the youth on them. Well, you know something I understand about good stewardship. You put in good carpet, you don't want it all messed up. But it rubbed me the wrong way that because I have new carpets now, I can't let the teens come in and have a devotional. You know, uh, I don't know. You could send them out in the yard when they got their, you know, their, their drinks and their lemonade and tea and such. I, it still seemed wrong. I can remember in Scotland, whenever the buses didn't run on Sunday like they, they do now, and therefore people had a hard time getting to our church building for worship, and there was no online option at that time. Uh, we, we would go drive people back and forth. And I had a minister look at me and goes, oh, don't do that. I've had people just wear out my cars over that. Well, aren't they there to be worn out? Isn't what we have there to be used? We're, in fact, aren't we supposed to be worn out? You hear people say, I'd rather wear out than rust out. I get that. I'm, I'm working hard on it. I'm, I'm running ahead of rust as fast as I can. Uh, where is your treasure? Have you ever had a kid break something and you completely demoralize and tear apart the self-concept of the kid because evidently you valued what was broken more than the kid? Even though the kid's going to live for a lot more years and carry this memory with them. Where's your treasure? I can remember walking into my, my office just north of Detroit and see, seeing something's different, and then I realized my guitars were gone. I thought, well, maybe somebody on staff borrowed them or down at the preschool, went to check. No, nope. it became obvious after a while these things were gone, baby gone. They were just, they're gone. Some of the, the people there, we had uh, different groups. We had, you know, AA and all of those groups, and some of them just got really upset when they found that out. And they said, we're going to go hit the pawn shops. We're going to go look. And I said, no. No, these things are not as important as the people that took them. Now, by the way, there are limits there. If somebody came and squatting in my house, I'd call the sheriff. I, you know, again, but these are just a few guitars. None of them were very expensive. That's why they were at the office was because they didn't have to be cared for and humidified and the like. But they were good. They were important to me. One of them had been given to me by a player of a very, very big name, and I'm not going to name drops, and name drop, and that, it, so I miss it. I miss it to this day. But it's all going to be end of the world kindling. I don't need to hold on to that. I don't need to hold on to anger, a call for vengeance, because that's not where my treasure is. Now, by the way, I've blown this many times. I'm just giving you an example of one where I did it right. So let's be honest. But we need to always gut check ourselves, not other people. You know, don't drive by later on an 8,000 square foot house and look up and go, well, I know where their treasure is. Hey, for all you know, they could have bought a 50,000 square foot one and they've downsized. We, we don't judge other people. We judge ourselves. Where's my treasure? 
I think a lot of grandparents know grandkids are the treasure. Yeah, treasure. Where, where's your heart? Then Jesus says something very Semitic, which means in a very Semitic kind of way, so, um, very Jewish kind of way. And it's not a, a way that we normally think. And so translating this verse is particularly tough without doing a paragraph of explanation. And so different translators work very hard trying to get this right. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? As that's an okay translation. But the thing is, I don't know of any English translation which is better than just okay. The older versions would say, your eye is the, the, the light of your body or the lamp of your body. If your eye is single, then your body will be full of light. But if your eye is many, you'll be full of darkness. So here it says healthy or unhealthy. I don't actually like the healthy, unlikely one. It, it, it's better to talk about single and many. Why? What are you focused on? Are you focused on your marriage? Focused on your work? Focused on your children? Focused on your worship? What are you focused on? If you focus on it, you will be full of light. But if you allow your mind and to constantly be distracted, then you will be unhealthy. You will be full of darkness. There won't be time to really be full of light. Think about the, the COVID years. Everybody thought it was going to be a couple of weeks and it ended up being more than two years. What books would you have read had you known it was going to be two years? Would you have learned that language you always wanted to learn? Had you known it was going to be two years? We always kept thinking it's going to be next month. It's going to be next month. So we didn't do those things. What about learning an instrument? Whenever you're quarantined at home that much, you had the opportunity. How about writing that novel you always wanted to write? How about writing some songs? You've always thought you could write better than you listened to. So did you do that? No. Because we assumed we're going to be out of there and our mind could be many again. Diverse, 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 diverse. My wife is, is an expert at every day making a list and every day working the list and at the end of the day checking the list. And I've learned a lot of things from her. I don't do that most of the time, but there are times where I realize, wait, I got to be here and then I got to get this done and these notes need to be taken care of. And learning from her, I make a list and I focus. The world does not want you to focus. The world wants you to look at every squirrel that runs. The world wants you to look at every shiny thing. The world will keep trying to hit you. And in fact, we now carry it around to where it's easier for it to distract us and grab us. I see pictures of people on vacation and videos. And as they're saying, look at this beautiful place, I'm seeing everybody else walking by with their heads and their phones. They're not seeing the beauty. They're not seeing the other people. They're not seeing people who have needs. They're not seeing things that they could be doing for Jesus Christ. They don't see any of that because their eye is on something which is flickering different, 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 different all the time. And just when you think, well, YouTube's too distracting, they'll, they'll bring out TikTok where everything's even shorter and it grabs, grabs, grabs. You got to go for the next one. There are literal studies done that show this is addictive and we're getting dopamine hits off of this. It's rewiring our brains. Somehow we need to learn how to focus, how to think, how to read a Bible story and sit back and really see the ins and outs of the story. As we're talking about on Sunday mornings now, we invite you into that, that series that we started back at the end of May, The Strange and Wonderful World of Scripture. But if you really see the story, it's very different than the way it's preached. It's very different from the Bible school little puppet way we've looked at things. And once you see it, it changes you. And it changes you for the good. Focus. And then he, he adds to this, no man can serve two masters. 
Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We, that's all lumped together. There could have been a big space between not serving God and money, but it's the same concept. Who is the master of your time? Who is the master of your attitude? Who is the master of your money? Who is the master of where that money goes and where it is used? Where is the master of these things? That's a very important question to be asked not just once, but several times daily. Who is the master of this? And then focus. Learn to focus. I did a Monday morning message on that. Uh, I think it's near the end of May. So you might want to go back and look at that. Moving on. Here's a tough one. Do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Once again, the point of the story is the point of the story. Don't try to overblow this. If you lay out your clothes for the day and the next day, then that the night prior, you're not violating this. If you have a funeral or a wedding coming up and you need to dress up for it, and you go in and you find out you don't fit in that suit or dress anymore, and you think, What am I gonna wear? That's legitimate. That's fine. He's talking about the people that always are concerned, I don't have enough clothes. I don't have enough food. I don't have enough money laid aside. I don't have always, always, always worrying. There's there's an insurance company in, in the United States that has a series of commercials where a man is teaching other people how not to become their parents. And it's a very funny, very funny series. And one of them, they're in an area shopping and a man comes with a shirt that he really likes. And the man teaching them says, does that shirt look familiar? And he's looking at it going, oh, he's wearing the same shirt. Have you ever bought something twice? Have you ever bought something and then found out you really didn't need it? Or that you'd forgot, oh, I already had something like that. The Bible says, pay attention. Pay attention. Don't stack up stuff. We used to have a rule in, in our marriage that if we hadn't worn it in six months, it was to be given away. We had to change that when we lived in Michigan because summer clothes, you could go eight months without needing those, sometimes nine months without needing anything other than parkas and sweaters. So we, we adjusted the rule. But the whole idea was let's not let the closet get crowded. Isn't that fascinating, by the way? We live in these houses and apartments and they have closets everywhere. Not like in Europe where you have to you know, buy a wardrobe and set it up. We've got them already there. And then we get them so full and we go, I just don't have place to put stuff. Well, that might be a sign you have way too much stuff. I can tell you as somebody who has cleaned out the property at first my father and then my mother after they pass. And they didn't have much then because they'd already downsized into residences. It was still so many times pick up and go, why? Why did this make the cut so many times and is still saved? This is nothing special. It has no connection to family or our history. What, what's going on here? We, my wife and I have decided to make it as easy as possible for our kids to go through our stuff uh, by making sure there's not too much of it. It's important that we share and give and that we don't pile up things and always worry about. The world will hit you with commercials constantly saying, you're going to run out of money before you die. So you've got to do this, that, and the other. And they're all different answers, as if these people knew the future. And then you'll have other commercials that'll say, you're going to die too soon, so you need to take all these pills. America's the only place I've ever lived where they can advertise prescription medication you can't go get. You have to go nag your doctor about it. And it's constant. 
worry about this, worry about that. They'll even say, do you have these symptoms? You might have, and then they'll do a disease you've never heard of. And people go, well, I might have that disease. We need to be really careful about letting the world continually scare us. We will do what we do, and God will do what he does, and we'll be fine. Eventually, we'll be fine. In fact, he says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? There's a lot of wisdom there, isn't there? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spend, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For pagans, unbelievers, people without God, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The wisdom packed into these verses is mind-blowing. But it also is mind-calming once you accept it. I can remember being at a, I had to go and spend all day at a place, speaking in the morning, speaking in the afternoon, speaking in the evening, before driving the about three hours home. Therefore, what I put on the morning before it be, the sun rose, that's what I was going to be wearing when I got home late at night. Well, after the morning sessions, there was a, a dinner, and I'm doing my dinner and, and such, when I see a little boy looking at me in just a big smile, and he comes tearing across to give me a hug. From many feet away, I could see that his face was smeared with jelly, peanut butter, and whatever else. And his hands were too. I didn't know this kid, but this kid looked at me, smiled, and decided that man needs a hug. And so uh, as he came, I just got down on my knees. He, whoomph, he gave me a hug, and I wore everything he had eaten the rest of that day. Now, did I think about it? A couple times. Did I worry about it? No. I figured, if people don't understand that kids can hug you and stuff get on your clothes, then I'm pretty sure they're not going to get anything else I'm teaching today. We all worry too much about these things. We are concerned about what others think. Let me just help you skip a couple of years of therapy, all right? Don't worry about what other people are thinking about you, because they're not. They're thinking about themselves and wondering what you're thinking about them. So why don't you just skip that part of your life? You don't need to worry about what other people are thinking because they're not thinking about you. And then he goes further. And here's where, oh, do we get some people. Judge not that you be not judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged with the measure you use. It will, it will be measured to you. I quoted that recently on Twitter. A bunch of evangelicals jumped on. We're supposed to judge righteously, though. We're supposed to inspect people's feet, uh, fruit. We're supposed to be doing, and all, doing their level best to find scriptures to negate what Jesus said. I know that impulse. I've been there. I used to do it, too. Whenever I would hit, an, let's say, an inconvenient verse, I'd try to find other verses to explain it away. When that's not necessary. Do you know what the original sin was? The original sin was not eating a fruit. The original sin was not even disobeying God in some way or the other. The original sin was eating the fruit so that they could become like God, judging for themselves, it's in scripture, what is right and what is wrong. That is it. You putting yourself in a place of God, deciding to judge others and decide who's right and wrong. 
in America right now, we're in a political season. We seem to always be in one now. And the world is demanding that you pick sides and judge the others. And if you don't judge the others, they're going to judge you. We don't judge. We don't say that, you know, that person doesn't deserve, they're bad, they're evil and the like. No, let's let God sort that out. Let the God of love handle that. America has survived bad presidents and good presidents, and they will again, maybe, if God chooses. But God doesn't even need America. God was doing fine before it. All nations rise. All nations eventually fall. And God continues. God is our king. Focus on him. Let him be the judge. It's some people believe that their job as Christians is to walk around judging others to decide what is right and wrong. The Bible does say to choose for yourself if this is right or wrong, but it says choose for yourself. Choose for yourself what is right or wrong. It never gives you choose for them. Decide if they are right or wrong. Instead, you can look at behavior and say, I don't approve of that behavior and I'm not going to do that behavior. But you can't look at the person and say, I don't approve of the person. The person is lost and sinful. That's God's job. The original sin was people trying to do God's job, and they're still doing it. I've even had people ask me, why does the devil show up in Scripture, but we don't see him you know, manifesting and showing up in that way around us? I said, because he didn't need to. Because his old lies are still working. If they quit working, maybe he'd need to show up and tell some new lies. But the old lies are doing just fine for him. Don't fall for it. Don't judge because the Bible says when we judge, we'll be judged in return. In fact, look at that. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? I want to go back. Hang on. I, I, what I want to look at first, the last bit of cha- uh, verse 2. With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Somebody pulls in front of you a little bit too abruptly. You go, you idiot. People should give you a ticket. The police pull you over for doing the same. I wasn't doing anything. Why didn't you give tickets to other people? You know, it's, no, the measure you use on others will be used on you. Because I know I need mercy and grace, that's why I choose to use mercy and grace. That's the measurement I want used on me. You might want it too. Now verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? That's supposed to be funny, by the way. So we're supposed to laugh. Like somebody's got this big log sticking out of there, big tube of four sticking out of their head, saying, you know, why, why do you go after you? And, and you're walking around going, wait, come over here, brother. I see a speck in your eye. I see a fault in you I need to correct. Because that's what it's talking about. I'm not talking about sawdust and beams. It's talking about me coming to you and saying, you know, I've noticed some real problems with you. I need to help you sort this out. And God's saying, you know, what's wrong with him is a mere speck compared to what's wrong with me. And he's saying it's ludicrous for us to go around trying to be the judge of other people because we have sin. We have a log in our own eye. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see more clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Oh, cool. Okay, cool, 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 cool. When we get rid of all of our sin, then we can judge other people. So when that's going to, when will that happen? Well, it's not going to. Whenever I see people on Twitter, Facebook, or the like, just attacking somebody, I'm going, wow, congratulations. They must have gotten rid of all their sin. And I say that sarcastically, but I also say it as a way to remind myself, don't join in. Don't jump in here until you've cleaned up you. And by the way, check my Facebook record over the years, my Twitter record over the years. I don't, I don't correct people. I don't jump on them. Why? Because I don't want to be jumped on. 
And the measure I use is the measure going to be used against me. So I'm pretty careful about that. Have I made errors? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's that whole, I got a plank in my eye thing. Because of that, when you listen to us on Sundays or Wednesdays or Mondays, you don't have me haranguing you like preachers do or going after you because you've got something in your life that I've just got to help you, you know, beat that out of you. No, we don't do that here because we take the words of Jesus very, very seriously here. And then another subject, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, in a way, this seems to be a contradiction because how are we supposed to figure out who the pigs are? He's just saying, if you are trying to do good and it's being trampled, turn away. You don't start yelling at them, you're pigs, you're pigs, you're pigs. No. Going, you know, my best efforts are not going to make a dent here. They're not going to help at all. There are many arguments that I've seen start before me that I've chosen not to enter into, even though I know how to debate rather well, and I know how to reason, and I can get my point across because I knew it wouldn't matter. When people start talking about that their feelings trump your facts or that I'm speaking my truth and you're speaking your truth, it's obvious there's no standard there, so I'm not going to try to enter in if only one of us thinks there's a standard. We're just let God take that. The Holy Spirit is not done with them. Let's let God take care of it. Don't beat your head against the wall. Uh, I've had people that ask me about others saying, do you think we can reach him? And I'm going, I don't think I can. But I know God can find somebody if he chooses. And anyway, I believe that God's grace covers them. So I'm not going to panic about this. You're not here to fix everything. You're here to live faithfully before God. It's a big difference, that. You're not here to run around disapproving. You're here to run around loving. Big difference. Well, just a little bit more, and then we will uh, we'll close this down. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. We'll close with this thought, even though the thought continues next week. Your life should not be a life of, I'd already found it, I already know it, I've already got it. Your life should be continually asking, seeking, and knocking. Looking at Jesus, focusing on Jesus, your eye being single, not worrying about what the world tells you to worry about, clothes and food and the like, but instead, I want to do this right for God. I want to make him proud of me today. I want to find somebody to love. I want to find somebody to give to. I want to, I want to make my life an example of the life of Christ today. Focus on that. How do I do that, God? I'm asking God. I'm seeking God. I'm knocking on the door asking God to open it up. That's who he wants. Those who wrestle with Israel. He wants those who wrestle with God. Those who, because um, Israel means wrestle with God. I blew that. It, he wants you to be engaged with him, to dance with him, to walk with him, to wrestle with him, to focus on him. And he says, you do that, you'll find it, you'll get it, you'll be there. That's good news. So we should probably end there. We'll see you next week.